Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. Early morning. Office. A meeting where a young and successful lawyer can barely keep his head upright. Sam can barely keep his eyes on the face of his mentor and boss Vanessa, who is excited about Sam's upcoming victories. Vanessa is gushing to the rest of her colleagues about how Sam has taken on the most difficult court case, of what meticulous style goes into success. But Sam doesn't care about that right now. He just wants to sleep. For the last time, having gathered all his strength in a fist, and pretending to be a fighting spirit in the next moment, Sam smoothly transferred everything to a quiet cool forest, where a brook murmurs in the distance. Birds were singing and bouncing on the branches of 1,000-year-old fir trees. Green grass envelops Sam's face. Somewhere in the distance under the blue sky flocks of white birds are circling. Sam lazily rises from the grass, glances at the bundle containing his night tent and smiles, anticipating a night of rest. There is still plenty of time before evening. For now we can relax, he thinks and slowly reaches for his backpack. In unison with the sound of lightning comes the aroma of homemade cinnamon-baked goods. Mom took care of it. I mean, she's my golden one. Thinks Sam as he unwraps a fresh bun in a paper bag. Next he pulls out a container of fools and cutlets. A second container is piled with fish and homemade tomatoes. Underneath them are several more containers, and the most important treat awaits Sam in the corner of the backpack. It is his portable litter thermos with coffee, with cream, which also mother herself brewed, poured, and put in the backpack. The glade turned out great. Only Sam was about to take a sip of coffee aroma. As Sam shouted, I'm setting you as an example to everyone here, and you disgrace me with your behavior. I can see why it's a promising case. It's going negative day after day, if you don't get a grip on yourself, you've got every right to put an end to your law career. Suddenly, it's Vanessa. Sam opened his eyes and managed to regret a thousand times that he hadn't stayed forever. Where I just set up the clearing, I missed something important. Vanessa, I'm sorry. I just didn't have time for coffee this morning, Sam said, and his eyes started to slip shut again. Sam, how much can you resort to childish scumbags? Last week, in exactly this condition, you were sitting and negotiating with a representative of our new partner. But you can't do that. It's even just unethical, Vanessa said, trying to sound stern. I agree with you, but this is solvable in a matter of hours, which I can't find in 24 hours, said Sam. To finish this habitual conversation with my supervisor as quickly as possible, and once again try to get back to my meadow with my birds chirping. The meeting was finally over. Sam hurried to his office with a thought about the unfairness of life, to human beings, by the infinity of their suffering. He decided to once again gather his strength into a fist and hold out until the lunch break. There it would be possible to take at least a little nap. When his co-workers left for lunch at the nearest cafe, Sam with such an optimistic mood began to prepare for the upcoming court hearing. True, in five minutes. His hands did not press the keyboard chaotically. The numbers in front of his eyes began to float and in an instant, Sam again found himself on the forest lawn, where his beautiful meadow was waiting untouched favor to the picture, added an important detail four-legged friend of Sam's childhood Mango, who has long been dead Mango, occasionally appeared in his dreams and took him to distant childhood carefree lands. And here he appeared again unexpectedly and waited for him by the clearing. Sam rejoiced when he saw his little dog Mango. He hugged her, rubbing his face on his coarse mango fur. It's so good to be together. Don't go away, I feel bad without you anymore. He mumbled, playing with his friend. Suddenly there was the sound of a gunshot to the face. And at that moment, Sam almost fell from his chair, hearing the squeak and scream of Vanessa Sam. Now that's the height of cynicism. You just got back from vacation. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? said Vanessa, and walked away. Sam realized with bitterness in his heart that all this wonderful thing that was happening to him was just a dream. And the sound of the gunshot was Vanessa's voice. Judging by the hint in the dream, she wasn't kidding about getting fired. Sam jumped out of his chair and ran after his boss. He caught up with her when she had already entered her office. Vanessa, I'm offering you a deal. 
From now on you pretend not to notice my condition, and I will somehow miraculously bring victories at all meetings. How did he tell you that? Without even talking me into it, I've had enough. You've been saying that for six months. I'd be fine if it were true. We know it's just an excuse. You sleep in clubs at night, so you don't have the energy to work. So from now on, your work won't get in the way of your fun. You can go clubbing 24 hours a day. Young people were very different in our time. We read books, went to the theater on weekends, and slept like normal people at night. And we got up at dawn and showed a shocking pace of labor. For me personally, it is just unbearable to see such inertia at such a young age as yours. Said Vanessa, you're right, of course. But entertainment is a cost of my work. I can't be in charge of people's lives all day long and then sleep well at night. I need to see the bright side of life once in a while, or I'll go crazy with the worries of my clients," said Sam. This is a clear sign of degradation and moral decay. If things continue like this, one of these days we're going to have to part with you on ethical grounds. You need to think about that," Vanessa said. Sam sat down on the edge of the chair and clutched his head with his hands. We need to be clear about who's breaking up with whom, he thought with a grin. He would have given up on everything himself and would have been sitting somewhere else a long time ago if it weren't for one big reason. It's a mysterious girl named Alice who works in the office next door. Vanessa, I'm asking you to give me one last chance. I'll make it up to you. I promise. It won't happen again. It's very stupid, even for me. But I can't live without this office, Sam said, taking a seat across from his boss and looking her straight in the eye. How can I believe your words? She asked. Sam felt like cursing, but that would be a failed strategy. He only need to keep mom here for six months to have time to find an approach to this Olsa Sam had to resort to professional secrets. I will honestly tell you I am very loyal to this company. As it is here from your wise guidance I have become a lawyer. Who would have thought it? Just four years ago, when I came in with a green law graduate, I could not have imagined what professional opportunities would open up for me here. And it's all thanks to you. Vanessa, you're the one leading us the right way, like Moses leading his people through the desert. Along the way, revealing the secrets and subtleties of such a difficult profession. But there is one small nuance. I really want to be believed in me, to be supported, not extinguished for the slightest misdeeds. And I am a young, ambitious, and promising manager who only needs to be directed in the right direction. And I find the way myself. You yourself said these phrases when you hired me. Let's remember those times and try to correct the situation together. Without your guidance, I can't get out of this dead end either. I begged Sam, why do you go into acting? You're wasting your talent. I'll forgive you this time. Thanks to your ingenuity. But let's not make fools of ourselves. You don't keep respectable people waiting in the morning. Keep up your professional ethics. Show up on time and normal. Do your job. You'll be worth your weight. It's a deal, Vanessa said, already visibly changing her tone. When Sam left his boss's office and headed for the kitchen, he heard a familiar voice behind him. What's up, loser? I hope you've already been kicked out for unprofessionalism. Robert, his colleague and competitor, shouted ironically after him. Only after you on the upcoming trial of the Bank Three Stars, I'll tear you to pieces, you'll lose, you'll face your clients. And then Vanessa herself will not want you here," replied Sam. You won't, buddy. I got it covered. You need to look for a new job instead of consoling yourself. By the way, I saw this ad. They're looking for a lentil delivery guy. Just for you, said Robert snidely. Sam didn't want to escalate the argument. He did not want to waste his nerves on this kidnapped and in love colleague. But his jokes had long since stopped being just jokes. Ever since Sam began to do well, he was unable to hide the fact that he felt outright envy. Sam was even a little turned on by it. I wish I could rub everyone's nose in it every time. Isn't that a good idea? All the more reason for him to deserve it, he thought, pouring himself a cup of coffee a little later. He liked his idea very much. Now Sam was determined to start a new life. In the evening of the same day, Sam was sitting in his kitchen chatting on the phone with a friend. Sam, so what about the rest of the party? The girls are waiting. What time will you be there? A friend asked Max. 
I'm sorry, Max, but now you and I are not on the same path, answered Sam. What's with the attitude? Are you in trouble? You won't believe this, but I've decided to start a new life. I've hired a coach to help me succeed in my career. Conquer this unapproachable Alice and become a human being. I even have a farm on my refrigerator. I'm creating a new reality. And you said a word about some clubs? I think you're still reeling from last night. Let me fix you up with a couple beers and you'll come to your senses, Max suggested. No, Max is dead serious. It's not nice to tempt a decent man with the devil's tricks. I risk ruining my reputation. I realize I've made it as a professional, but not yet as a person. And my job is stressful. I'm not clinging to it though. I could've gotten a job elsewhere without any trouble, but there's one. In the office next door, she's a tough nut to crack. If I don't get her, I can't forgive myself for failing so badly. So I have to be patient with my boss for a while, said Sam. Sorry, buddy. You're really screwed. Max laughed into the phone. You just be a decent person for a couple days. And on Friday night, I'll call you while I entertain the girls. He decided to start a new life. Haha. -ha. Max laughed until Sam hung up the phone. No, what? You gotta come to your senses and grow up sometime. So Max doesn't sabotage, we'll move on. Sam said to himself and started dialing his mother's phone number. She picked up the phone quickly. Her surprise was unrivaled. Sam's son. What happened again? She asked. Disturbed. Hi, mom. Why is there something wrong? Can a grown-up son just call his parents and ask about their health? How's dad? How's his treatment going? Why don't we send him to a resort somewhere? Get away together, Sam said. I'm worried about you. Let's get it straight. What's wrong? You wrecked the car again. There's trouble at work. What is it this time? Asked my mother. Mom, if you don't want to have a serious talk, maybe I shouldn't call you. You don't believe your grown son can finally get a grip on his mind and just become responsible either, said the words of my God. He heard my prayers. Of course I do, son. I do. Besides, it's high time you started thinking about these things. 30 years old is a good age. What was the cause of it all? Mom asked. It doesn't matter. That's not what I'm talking about. That's what I'm calling about. Tell your dad not to worry about me. To think more about your health. I'll give you the same advice. Get plenty of rest. Take care of your health. You'll need it to nurse your grandchildren. That's what you wanted. Didn't you? Asked Sam. Of course, son. It's such a long-awaited happiness for us. Who's the bride? When did you meet her? Asked mom, almost fainting with joy. In a couple of months, we still need to pull up some things at work. I'm still aimed at career growth, and it requires concentration. As soon as I get things straightened out, I'll let you know the date and place of meeting your fancy. Will you like her? Said Sam, imagining how the noble Alice would impress his family. Then he dialed another number, the husky voice at the end of the line did not immediately recognize him. Andrew, hello, it's Sam. I work in your law firm Platon and Partners. We sometimes cross paths with you when you come to our office, Sam said. Oh yeah, I remember some of the words. Is there a problem? Asked the boss. No, I just wanted to ask about your health. After all, health is a man's greatest asset, especially at your advanced age but small. I know that's not why you're calling. Speak plainly. There's something wrong with the company. Asked Andrew. Everything's fine. I've got a new case about to close successfully. We're looking at a six-figure retainer. And you hinted to me a couple months ago that you wouldn't mind defaming the whole company. I'm just thinking about it now. And it feels good. It's inspiring, Sam said. I take your point. But you should know that Vanessa is my most trusted confidant. She and I have been doing business together for 20 years. I can't just throw her out on the street unless she wants to retire, Andrew said. You are right, Andrew. In fact, Vanessa could use a well-deserved rest, as she has been having a lot of problems at work lately, falling asleep in a meeting or forgetting important meetings. But we certainly support her, help her out of deep respect for her status and age. I think we will continue to do the same, even if she gets worse, Sam said. Sam, I hear you, you will notice in her place. Let's keep this conversation between us for now. I'll think about your candidacy. 
If you continue to perform well, why not? For Vanessa, I can find another position that's less of a hassle, but it'll take time. I'll think about it, Andrew promised. When the conversation was over, Sam felt an unprecedented satisfaction. It turned out that the prospect of growing up was very interesting. It seemed to be the key to all doors. And why hadn't he thought of doing it before? Sam got up, walked over to the refrigerator and read his detailed plan for inspiration. Three months from now to meet Alice's parents, six months from now to get married. At the same time, he should depose Vanessa and take her place. And in a year, when he will take his son from the hospital, he will celebrate his promotion to vice president of his company. It's beautiful. Now we can sleep. Meanwhile, in one of the parallel realities in another part of the planet, there was a conversation between two executives. Paul, I am glad that we finally managed to enter the market, and soon we will open our branch there. Your merit in this is invaluable. This was the head of a large foreign corporation, Mark. Thank you for your appreciation, Mark. But we can really rejoice when the opening is successful, and we reach the expected figures in just a few months, replied Paul. You are right, Paul. We have big plans and the goals are very important. I'd like to talk to you more about that. To be honest, you puzzled me when you said that you refused to run the new branch and that you want to be in the background. In that case, I'd like to hear your proposal for a new manager. It has to be a proven person. We need to find one from our own circle of managers on this scale. And you can't take on a new branch from outside. It would be a big risk, Mark said. I see your point. Are you asking me if I have someone in mind? Paul asked. Exactly the boss answered. There's a guy. He just happens to live in the town where we'll be turning around. I can vouch for him 100%. His name is Sam. We've been friends since we were kids. We haven't talked as much in recent years. But I wouldn't mind doing some serious business with him. He's an accomplished lawyer now, Paul said. And what is Sam remarkable? Tell me, said Mark. It was back when I was a kid. We were both backyard kids. There was a swampy lake not far from our town. We go out there sometimes, swim in safe places. There were markings you couldn't cross. Legend had it, what kind of markings live there? Swamp devils. And if a person gets close to it, the devils can drag you into the swamp. We believed in this legend and were afraid to step over the markings. But one day, when we were playing soccer on the lawn, the unexpected happened near the lake. Our ball flew far beyond the marks. The boys ran after the ball and stopped at the mark, not daring to step over it. Then one of us said that we could quickly jump into the swamp, take the ball and back, go back along the surface. Before the swamp devils woke up and noticed us, I considered myself the bravest among the locals. It was important for me to save face, so I then said, guys, it's all nothing. There are no devils in the swamps. That's how grown-ups fool us. You'll see for yourself. I'll go get my sword. The boys were surprised at my decision, but no one discouraged me. Except Sam, he said that vanity ruins young men, and we laughed at his words and called him a coward. I went into the swamp. Indeed, the surface turned out to be not so dangerous. After taking a few steps, I reached the ball, grabbed it, and threw it to the guys on the shore. And when I turned around to climb back out, I felt my feet hit a cold and dense space with no support. I tried to lean on the other foot to get out of the hole, but immediately I felt the bottomless density under the second foot. By that time, my companions had already returned to the lawn and started playing. And I panicked when I called for help. The guys didn't believe me. They said I was just scaring them like adults. But Sam didn't argue. He quickly undressed and went into the swamp too. By that time, I was already slowly sinking into the water at full height. The water reached my chest, and the more my legs dangled, the faster I was sinking, and I realized that I would never get out of the swamp. But Sam was already standing a step away from me and pulling my hand out. Sam, get out of here. We could sink together. I shouted to him, no fool. Give me your hand and stop panicking. Shouted back at him. I gave my hand, but my hopes were in vain. Sam too was trapped underwater. I started to dangle my legs harder. I went deeper and deeper under the water. Then Sam shouted to me, Paul, stop fussing, you'll get out. He yelled, 
I thought he was just calming me down. But Sam realized it in time. Paul, don't be such an idiot, just stop wiggling your feet. Relax and try to lie on your back. Leave your legs alone, it on your hands and try to get out across, not up, he said. Only then did it dawn on me that Sam was not just reassuring, but actually trying to help. Following his cues, I managed to free one leg, but by then Sam himself was pulled in deep. When I finally managed to get out, Sam was no longer visible on the surface. I was devastated by what had happened. I thought that my comrade had died saving me, but tragedy was avoided. By that time, the other guys had managed to call the forest ranger, who were not far away. Those pulled to the shore Sam, who was unconscious. When my comrade came to his senses, I asked him if he realized that he was risking his life. His answer struck me very hard. He said yes, but I would not have forgiven myself if I had not tried to save you, he said then. Since that day, Sam has been imprinted in my memory as an example of a loyal friend, a brave man, and a real man. This is the man I would like to propose to us as a new companion. Paul concluded his monologue. What, the story is very touching. If your friend in childhood was so wonderful, I think that adulthood has only made him better. Then you should call him ahead of time and feel him out just in case. If he has other plans, we should try to entice him to join us, Mark said. On a most ordinary morning, Sam was awakened by an early phone call. Slavinsky, are you still sleeping there? Did you even recognize your friend? Asked a cheerful male voice. Paul is my friend. How could I not recognize you? How come I remembered you? Did you come or what? Sam rejoiced. Not yet, but I will be soon and for a long time. In fact, that's why I'm calling you. And how do you accept promising offers from old friends? Asked Paul. Well, let's say, and you heard from my boss, Mark. He's opening a new branch office in your town. I'll be the vice president of the new company, and we need a reliable man to run it. There's only one reliable person I know. That's you. How do you feel about running an entire finance company? Your lawyering experience and knowledge will come in handy. You don't have to worry about the salary. Mark values his top managers highly. You'll be on the list of not so poor people in a year or two, Paul said. Your offer comes in handy. I've almost hit my ceiling in my little office. I'm looking forward to moving up. When can I expect you? Asked Sam excitedly. If everything goes according to plan, then in about three months we will already begin to realize what we have planned. Counting on this time, I will arrive in advance, and the first thing I will do is to contact you. And then the boss himself will arrive. I'll introduce you to him. I'm sure you're paying, Paul said. The friends said goodbye on an optimistic note. Sam hung up the phone and shrieked with joy. Vanessa and Robert. You're both going to the woods for mushrooms soon. And your hated Sam will be flying on private jets and giving interviews to the leading channels of the country. Eh, hey, he said aloud. Then he got out of bed and headed for the bathroom, not yet realizing what fate had in store for him. Walking into the bathroom, Sam was surprised not to see his reflection in the mirror. To be more precise, he saw only his head in the mirror, and then in the lowest part. What kind of joke is this? He said and stretched his hand above his head. His hand appeared in the mirror. Sam took a stool, brought it into the bathroom, put it in front of the mirror, and stood on it. And now you can see his full height. True, his height is no longer the same. Even less than one meter, and his face is the same as it was 23 years ago, when he was six years old. Sam was slowly panicking. He had certainly had a good dream of his childhood yesterday, but he wasn't going to literally go back there. He convinced himself that it was some sort of glitch in his perception. Not believing what he saw, he went into the living room and stood in front of the large mirror. Yeah, mirrors don't lie. His childish appearance really came back to him. Sam sat down on the sofa and began to think hard about the reasons for this transformation. But no clue could be found in his head. After sitting for an hour, he finally decided to drink coffee. Suddenly, everything would fall into place. But when I walked into the kitchen, I found a little note next to the coffee maker. You wanted to go back to your childhood, to sleep and play. Here it is. But you can become an adult again at any time if a grown-up girl loves you and kisses you on the lips. He read the words. 
Then he searched his apartment in vain for someone who could have written it. Called Max's friend, asked tons of questions, went to the mirror dozens of times and looked out of himself. But from all this nothing in his new life changed. The time was directly approaching 8 o'clock and reminded him that successful lawyer Sam could not be late for important meetings. Little Sam was frustrated as his short legs struggled to reach the pedals of the car. And if his feet could be placed on the pedal, his head was already below the horizon of the road. His attempts to adjust had failed, and the hours were running out. He had to call a cab. Seeing Sam's successful lawyer, the cab driver ran out of the car, took a passive leather folder from his hands and put it on the back seat. Why are you carrying such heavy weights all by yourself? Dad's briefcase decided to show off at school, said the driver. He's moving off. Sam was angry at first and then tried to seize the opportunity. Yes, you're right. My father is an important man, but he's a little sick right now, so I decided to go to work instead and finalize an important deal, said Sam. The driver first laughed, looking into the child's clear eyes through the rearview mirror, and then asked, well, how are you going to close an important deal? Do you even know who to tell and what to say? Maybe you're just Sacco eating lessons, asked the driver. You're being ironic. I'm telling the truth. I'm an expert on the level of my father. It was he who taught me. Wouldn't you like to make an extra couple hundred dollars an hour? Sam asked. Is that a good idea? What do you have to do? I hope it's not criminal. Asked the driver. How can I encourage you to do something illegal? Morals and ethics. That is the basis of public order in my charge, said Sam to demonstrate his reliability. Mouth said that, but say what you have to do. The driver interjected. I'm worried that I might not be allowed in my father's place. The masses think in stereotypes, you know. They'll think that since I'm so small, I don't know or know how to do anything. Maybe you're filling in for me at one of my court hearings, said Sam. Are you seriously asking me to act as an attorney at a court hearing? I have a degree in engineering, of course. But with the lawyer's role, I don't know how well it will work out. I'm afraid you and I will be exposed. Then there will be trouble, said the driver. Fear is the eternal obstacle to change in life. It's your right to refuse, said Sam and turned away to the window. Are you offended? I'm just worried about you. I don't even feel bad about helping you for free, said the driver, noticing his resentment. So you agree? That's fine. Here's the plan. You keep your cell phone on at all times. You and I will be in touch. That way I can hear what the others are saying. And I'll text you back. All you have to do is read out the standard phrases. Our job is to get the trial rescheduled to a new date. That's it. I've said the words. So word for word. Sam persuaded William the cabbie to play lawyer. Technically, everything had been worked out. Thanks to Sam's efforts, the bankruptcy court case was able to be rescheduled to another date. William walked out of the courtroom and was surprised. Listen kid, this is how I can become a real lawyer. I didn't know it was that easy, he said. That's not all. Now you need to go to my client's representative and get the money. He'll be waiting for you in the cafe on the first floor, and I'll be outside on the bench. I'll see you there. I'll give you your fee said Sam and headed out into the street, a small green garden on the territory of the business center. Sam had noticed this place in the morning. As soon as he saw the fountains, small statuettes of cute animals and squirrels jumping on the branches, his eyes lit up. And now he was hurrying to that place to get a closer look at everything, while William got the money and brought it to him. Sam set the heavy leather briefcase on the bench and headed toward the statue. But on the way, his attention was caught by a cat that was sitting under the bench and looking up, looking up, looking up. Sam saw those very cute squirrels jumping from one branch to another. I wish I could catch one, he thought, and started looking for ways to climb the tree. The tree turned out to be convenient for the eye not now left. He crept up to the squirrel so that they would not have time to sneak away from him. The cat sat below and watched with interest. This encouraged Sam even more. So he didn't notice how much time passed about the cat and William downstairs. He remembered when he got hungry. Sam let go of the squirrel and went down to the ground to call William. But all his attempts were in vain. Only a couple of hours later a short message came from Velodia. 
The money turned out to be good for me, thanks, kid. Good luck with your studies. Sam still couldn't believe he'd been duped. He tried calling again and again, texting William in the style of so unfair. We had a deal, but all he got in response were smiley faces. As the time approached noon, Sam's phone rang again. There's a reason they say trouble doesn't come alone. It was Vanessa. Sam decided to play along and win at least this phone call. What if tomorrow morning he woke up a grown man again? Yes, Vanessa, do you have something urgent? He asked, trying to sound as serious as possible. Forgive the words. If this is a bad time, I saw on your task list. Like you have an important meeting today. I wasn't going to distract you for a while. Interrupted? Yes, I'm listening to you, speak, said Sam, even more seriously. Andrew dropped by and said he wanted to talk to you about a serious matter. Said it was important. He promised to come back next week when you're free. That's actually what I wanted to tell you, the supervisor replied. Do you know what he's here for? Maybe you have some options. Sam decided to feel the ground under his feet, remembering the recent conversation with the main boss about his promotion. He said we were ready for a new change. He also said something about personnel issues. I figured that was all he wanted to discuss with you, Vanessa said. Sam was glad that, although his body and manners were childish now, he still had his lawyer's sense and knowledge. He immediately sensed the uncertainty in Vanessa's voice, and he was right. Because Vanessa's evil tongues had already told him that Andrew wanted to make a number of personnel changes. Besides, Andrew himself did not hide his obvious sympathy for Sam when talking to Vanessa. And Vanessa also had her instincts. Having analyzed the situation, she understood everything correctly. Her position of leadership was shaken. Andrew usually acts decisively in such matters. If he wants to appoint someone, he appoints them without a second thought. The same goes for firing someone. Vanessa became uneasy. Wandering around all day chasing city squirrels, crows, and yard cats. Sam didn't notice the evening had come. He was terribly hungry and had no idea what to do in such cases. He also found that his clothes were dirty and his pants were even snagged and ridiculously torn. As he passed a fast food outlet not far from his house, he smelled the aroma of shawarma and rejoiced. This was what he really needed. He walked into the roadside establishment, took a seat at a table, and ordered all of his favorites. True, he was only able to eat half of his order. When it was time to pay, Sam reached into his pants pocket. That's where the tragedy of adulthood hits him. Not enough money to pay for what he bought. And across the street, a menacing waiter is standing there, losing patience with the boy's slowness with every passing second. I told you to be careful with unaccompanied children, you can't do anything with them. Now he's going to make you feel sorry for accidentally losing the money. They do that a lot. They spend their pocket money on gambling, and then they get pissy. He'll clean up his own mess, said his colleague, a girl passing by. I'm not going to push pity, Sam muttered to her. But then you're in a hurry, kid. People are waiting for a table to be free, the waiter hurried. Sam thought about it and decided that the right thing to do in this case would be to be honest. And he has no choice. Kids always have a complicated relationship with money. He had plenty this morning, and now he can't even remember where he put it down. After thinking for a few minutes, he took out his cell phone and dialed a number he usually dials very rarely. Mom, hi. He said with sadness in his voice. Sam, what's wrong with your voice? Are you sick or a jerk? asked his mother. What's wrong with my voice? asked Sam. But it's kind of childish, insecure, or something. I thought it might be something wrong, replied the mother. Mom, here's the thing. It's a little hard to explain. Dad has to come get me and pay for the shawarma, said Sam. That's a bad joke, son. You stopped eating kebabs 15 years ago. You like good meat. How could kebab be in your life? Mother laughed. Mom, I'm serious. There's a bigger problem here than kebabs. Let dad come, I'll tell him everything when I meet him. Sam insisted. In the end, the mother bewilderedly agreed to send the father, and at the same time came herself. Seeing an eight-year-old boy instead of a 30-year-old man, the mother and father looked at each other and sighed heavily. 
Sam was searching for words to explain his mysterious transformation. But his mother sat down beside him and said, don't be upset. We all realized what had happened to you. I had a premonition of it, she said, while Frank's father was paying off the waiter. Well, don't tell us much. What are your plans for life now? His father patted him on the shoulder when they had already gotten into the car. I have an important meeting tomorrow. I was wondering if you could go in my place. I'll tell you what to say over the phone. You only have to repeat yourself, Sam said, hiding his torn pants with his hands. Mother, we should get our son some new clothes on the way. And yes, lawyer Sam, we suggest you stay with us for a while. We're not strangers after all. We saw you once when you were as old as you are now. We still do. And now we'd love to have you like this, Dad said. Stop. Mom, Dad, don't you even want to ask me what happened to me? How did you even know what happened? Asked Sam with surprise. Mom smiled and said it's your genes, son. Sam was even more surprised. What do you mean genes? Are you saying that this happened to someone else before me? He asked. But Dad, will you tell me or will I tell you? Asked his mother with a smile, looking at his father. I was 25 years old, just graduated from the institute and got a job. And then bang, I wake up in the morning and see myself like you and small. Of course, I was frightened. But then I found a note on the table that I could return to adulthood only after I was kissed by my beloved, that is your mother. And she didn't even know I was in love with her then, Frank said. Sam wondered, why didn't you ever tell us about it? So how did you manage to get out of that matrix glitch? He asked. I had to hustle to get your mom to pay attention to me. And then I had to find an approach and win her heart, Dad said. What a surprise, Dad. I got a letter too. The condition is the same. I have to be kissed by a girl who doesn't even know I'm here. But I'm more worried about the prospects. I've got some big cases coming up. And a promotion. And maybe even the management of a new company. I've got three months. What do I do? Well, you're gonna have to win this girl over in three months. Or can you just leave it at that? You'll grow up in a natural rhythm. Take a break from your career and get a better mind," said the father and laughed. Sam, horrified. What are you talking about? You're suggesting that I go to school in the morning for 10 more years, then go to university for five more years, and go through Vanessa's set of experiences all over again. Oh no, put me in a foster home or an orphanage. But I don't want to go through all that again. I actually dreamed of childhood because I really wanted to sleep. And now I realize how wrong I was. You can't sleep when you're being cheated at every turn, when money's flowing out of your pocket. Every adult looks down on you. Would your own parents be willing to put you in school for 10 years? No, I don't want that, Sam said, and started whining. But that's enough whining. Dad has experience, he'll help you. You will, Dad. The mother turned to her husband. You have to look at it. If the girl is worthy, why not? If our dummy in his 30s fell in love with some bitch, he deserves to be punished by growing up again. Let him go to school and university. Maybe he should even join the army for discipline. And you and I will have a chance to fill in the gaps in his upbringing. That one was frivolous. We'll finally raise a mature man, Dad said. What's it all about now? We'll go to see her together, asked Sam. No, son, that would look silly. We're going to focus on growing you into a mature man. As long as you get a second chance, said the father. The family council ended with Sam going back to school soon. Despite Sam's resistance, his parents promised to take care of his upbringing and studies. But he didn't have time to argue much, as he fell asleep at the table after eating his mother's cutlets and drinking the yogurt he had begged for on the way home. Alice woke up in a bad mood this morning because she had been dreaming about her Nick all night. They've been dating for two years now, a year of which has consisted of hurt feelings and disagreements. I have to end it. I don't want that kind of relationship. Alice thought, pouring herself a cup of coffee. But then the phone rang and she saw the caller's name on the screen. It made her immediately forget her plans. It was already warm and bright in the city. And that's probably because my sunshine is already up and going to work, Nick said. Where have you been? I waited for you all night last night. Why didn't you even call? Asked Alice. I was out with my friends. 
but tonight I'm all yours, he replied. I'll think about it. Tonight I may have plans of my own, said Alice. What can I say then? I suggested it, Nick replied. Alice finished the conversation and realized that her mood had deteriorated even more. True, she had no other plans for the evening and did not foresee any. But the guy's indifference pissed her off. But it wasn't evening yet. The day passed without much fun. Alice had to go to a job she didn't like. All day to pretend to be a workaholic waiting for the end of the working day. When she got off work, she decided to have a little holiday by herself. She made plans in her head. Until a child's voice called out to her. Girl, you're so beautiful. I haven't met anyone like you anywhere else, said a small chubby boy, catching up with her from behind. Oh, hello, you're so cute. Thanks for the compliment, she smiled. And this flower for you? I picked it myself in the garden behind that building. The boy pointed in the direction. Thank you. Why did you get lost alone? Alice asked. It's a long conversation. I really don't want to upset you with my tragic story, said the boy and bowed his head that won't do. You're a man. Come on, tell me what happened. Maybe there's something I can do to help you, said Alice. She knelt down in front of the boy. No, I'm sorry, I don't want to burden anyone. It's just something I read in a book. Treat others the way you want to be treated. So I wanted to do something nice for someone, the boy said inside. Where are you going now? Do your parents know that you are walking alone in the city? Alice asked. They don't know. They're at work right now, but they're golden. I wander so aimlessly looking for the meaning of events in the world, said the boy. Alice laughed. You're very funny. Would you like to keep me company? I'm going to a cafe. We'll sit nearby, eat, have a nice chat. Then I'll walk you out, said Alice. The boy was happy. I'd love to. Only I have one condition, he said. And what's that? I'll pay for dinner. I have money. I saved it from my allowance. Here it is, said the boy and patted his pants pocket. Oh, you Skoda. Let's go, let's eat first, then we'll figure it out, said Alice. The boy walked beside her, feeling proud that he was walking next to such a beauty. They entered the cafe, took a seat by the window. The waiter came up. For Mademoiselle, the best wine, said the boy to the waiter. Alice laughed. Don't mind him, he joked. I don't plan to drink tonight. And give my vis-a-vis -a, -vis a milkshake and something to eat. What do you like? Alice asked. I'd actually prefer Tartarstin, but it's better at Claude Monet's. By the way, next time we'll go there, said the boy to Alice. For now, I think I'll be content with veal and turek, he added. Alice laughed the whole time and ordered herself something fancy too. And he hadn't even told me his name yet. Business boy, Alice said when the waiter left. Sam is my name. I will be immensely happy if you call me, just the lord of my soul, Sam replied. Alice was laughing now. And you know, when beautiful girls laugh, it has the same effect on men as owning the coolest car, said Sam. How old are you smart? She asked. God willing. Health will be eight this year. I intend to celebrate this day lavishly. I've already discussed with my parents all the expenses, they'll take care of them. I hope you will not refuse me the honor of being, respected my guest, said the words. And how do your parents feel about you socializing with grown-up girls? They would probably be shocked, asked Alice. Don't worry. They have liberal views and everything relationship issue is no exception, although they themselves lead a traditional way of life. They have been married for almost 35 years, said Sam. I think they are unique people, they deserve to tell the whole country on TV about how to raise such a son," said Alice. Would you want a son like that? I asked Sam suddenly. Did Alice blossom? Her eyes lit up. Who wouldn't want one? Of course I would. But his father would have to be like that. I'm having trouble choosing. Men always come across as infantile, Alice said. I understand. I've been through it myself, said Sam and stared at Alice. Did you go through it in kindergarten or something? Alice laughed. I have a long life story to tell in parts. For now, I just want to enjoy this evening. Look at the beautiful couples walking along the streets of our cities. I wish I could join their ranks someday, Sam said wistfully. The whole evening passed merrily, while Alice interjected, and every pearl of the fictitious boy was photographed with him. She videotaped some of his quotes to show her friends. Sam didn't refuse her anything. 
You won't invite me home, of course. And as a real gentleman in the future, of course, I won't ask. But thank you for the evening. Would you mind if I waited for you at the exit from work from time to time? I asked Sam goodbye. No, I wouldn't mind. The main thing is that parents do not think badly and do not worry, said Alice. She said goodbye and went home in high spirits. Sam time. It's almost nine o'clock. Why haven't you gotten ready for school yet? Asked my father in the early morning. Dad, I've been doing things since eight o'clock. I'm working. Vanessa's looking for me. And I've got a meeting with Andrew coming up. We were just discussing my promotion earlier. Now we have to do something about it, preferably without losing money. Dad, you're the only one who can help me with that. So I'll be a couple hours late from work, said my eight-year-old son, who can barely carry his backpack from school to home. Son, save your business for better times, things will work out, or will you grow up? Then you'll get organized again. In the meantime, enjoy your childhood. Besides, we've already agreed that this time it's on me and mom. Frank said, Dad, are you kidding? You're 55 now, and by the time you get me back on my feet, you'll be 75. Isn't that a lot of energy and resources for one kid? So knock it off. I've got exactly three months, and I can hold on to what I've accomplished and put myself out there. You'll see, just don't refuse to help me, said Sam. After a long argument, Frank agreed to help his son. Today, they would have a meeting with Andrew, who intended to appoint Sam to run his small company instead of Vanessa. Sam persuaded his father to go to the meeting with him. What would be the result? What will be the reaction of a solid man to a father with a young son? Both have no idea. Hello, Andrew. Permission to come in. A little boy knocked on his door. Boy, who are you? What are you doing here? He was surprised. I'm here with my grandfather. We're here on business. But let's not talk from the doorstep, the boy said. Seeing a child and a grown man, Andrew thought that this is one of the many who regularly ask him to sponsor various social projects. But the boy started talking about something else. Andrew, you know my father well. Sam, I'm his son. And here is my grandfather. We came to you on his behalf, Sam said. And how is that? Why didn't he come himself? I haven't been able to catch him for two weeks. Did something happen to him? Asked Andrew. He's all right. You can do all your business with me instead, said the boy. Andrew smiled. No, it won't work that way. I need Sam myself, and you won't distract me. Dismissed, he said, and pointed to the door. Why? Why do you trust the close people of someone who was able to win a millionaire's divorce suit? Why wouldn't you want to deal with those who stood by you? When Sam himself found the victims, alarmed the bank, gathered all the victims, convinced them to write a statement, and then at the trial he was able to prove the bank's guilt. Yeah, he didn't win that case yet, but it's a matter of time. You don't allow the idea that if Sam has such a support group around him, he is capable of making mountains. What does your business sense think about that? Asked the boy. Oh, you're so smart. When will you grow up? You're the one I trust with a lot of things, said Andrew. Well, then consider me a little copy of Sam. In fact, you can even discuss personnel matters with me. I remember my dad saying the other day that he was getting a promotion with your help. I approved of his bold move at the time. If I can impress you, I'm sure I can take my father's place during his absence, the boy said. But that's out of line. The law says I can't hire kids, no matter how smart they are. You better try to get more A's. Then you'll be more useful, Andrew said. I also remember Dad telling me that the final court hearing was in a couple weeks. If Dad doesn't make it back from his trip by then, here's my phone number, one call from you, and I'll perform brilliantly at the trial. And then it's just a matter of time before you win, the boy said, writing down some numbers on a piece of paper. Andrew laughed. Grandpa, he's not only smart, but also enterprising. Well, I'll know who to consult from now on. You just tell Sam not to fool around and come back soon. Good lawyers are indispensable, Andrew said. That concluded the negotiations. Dad, I don't understand why you were sad. Asked Sam when they went outside. What's there to be happy about? You see, we couldn't persuade him to let you continue working in your childish form. We've failed you, he said. No, it's too early to draw conclusions. 
it's not that obvious how it all works. The main thing is that we managed to run certain scenarios in the boss's head. Like how I handle the lawsuit if I can't be an adult again by then. That's one. Secondly, we showed him that Sam has a team behind him, which positions Sam as a good, decent family man. Although that's a far cry from reality. I didn't expect him to say yes right away. They're the boss, and they don't decide anything right off the bat. You have to give them an idea a little at a time, and they'll mature slowly. The important thing is that we've started the process. You'll see, closer to the case. He'll call me himself, you have my word. What is this, some kind of lawyer trick? Frank asked his son. Not exactly a lawyer's trick. It's used by all politicians, businessmen, smart officials and executives of all stripes. If you act slowly, you can tempt a person to do anything. Here for example, our neighbor Maria lives with her alcoholic husband and doesn't know how to get out of her nightmarish life into another reality. You know there's a funny thing about that, said the word. What's the joke? Dad asked. If Maria at the beginning of their novel showed their life together with her husband in a fast pace, there's no way she would have agreed to tie her life to him. It's just that all these alcoholics, tyrants and other teachers to them know how to play the long strategy. They take it a little at a time. The first time he had a few drinks and just yelled. Maria didn't react or protest. The second time he lets himself push her. She doesn't react. The third time he tries to kick her if she doesn't protest by running away or fighting back. But one day they'll get to the point where her husband will kill her and wonder why the wife didn't fight back for real. Do you see how this works? Asked his father's words when they were already seated at his favorite fast food place. At that moment, a man sitting at a neighboring table stood up and approached them. Hello, I'm sorry to bother you. I assume this is your son, he asked. Yes, my son. A grandson, you might say. He has another son, but he is away. His name is Sam and so am I. My parents are okay with creativity, said Sam and smiled. The unfamiliar man patted the unfamiliar man, patted Sam on the shoulder and turned to Alexander Nikolaevich. I am a director, I make movies. I wanted to invite your son to the casting. He is a multifaceted person. He has several talents. One of them can be in the movie, said the man and held out his card. Thank you. We will definitely be there, said Sam and quickly grabbed the business card from his father's hands. Why else do you need a movie when you can't deal with school? Sam asked his father when the strange director had left and they were alone again. It's a chance. Daddy's chance to spin Sam. He's kind of out of the picture. But you're right about the school. I should be getting that place cleaned up. I think I'll take a look at it one of these days. I see the teachers have lost their way, especially the headmaster. I'm not even talking about the head teachers. They're still dancing, said Sam. Where did you disappear those times? When I left you at school, the teacher complained that you were running away from lessons, said the father. I've got things to do, dad. Life isn't long enough to give decades of years to useless schooling. There they teach you to learn. And a person needs other skills to make money, to make a life and build a career, Sam said. And some skills that are not taught in school. And you yourself became such a person, thanks to what school and university made you so smart. Well, of course, I have my own merit, said my father. Dad, I'll tell you a little secret. 1,000 young people graduate from my school. University, too. But where are they now? Some get drunk, some get into other trouble. And what happens to the girls? Graduates from the same university, same department. One ends up working as an escort, the other marries a future oligarch. Why does this happen? Asked Sam. Well, it's all a personal choice of the individual, I think, said the father. If everything was a personal choice, everyone would choose the most wonderful life. Whatever is possible, if a person could choose, they wouldn't have any problems. It's just that we are not taught anywhere to think according to reality. Neither in university nor in school is it taught, said Sam. So you should be happy that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. All the knowledge you need is already given to you in a ready-made form. You don't have to discover the laws of physics from scratch, discover theorems. Cosin and tangent, said the father. That's true. 
but it's not enough. Dad, I know dozens of those who perfectly know the laws of physics and still remember Newton's formula, but do not know at what moment to go to the chief and what arguments to convince him of a promotion or salary, said Sam. And what do you suggest? I'm completely confused, my father said when they were almost home. I'm just answering your questions. I'd like to suggest that you don't make me go to school, but take me with you more often. And we'll go to the audition together too. Will you support me? I'll write down the exact words and you'll learn them, you said the word. My God, gave me such a smart son, said Frank. Listen, if you've become so smart, why haven't you grown up to be an executive? Why do you sit in the same office for five years? And your salary is not enough for such a mind? Asked my father. Dad, you're smarter than me. But your salary has always been half as much as mine. Well, let's let this argument go. I'll probably disappoint you, but I won't become rich soon or not at all. Normally, wealth grows in proportion to a person's development. But for some people, the proportion is uneven. They may grow as individuals by 10 units, but financially by one unit. This means that their mental and personal potential is nine times greater than the financial capacity of the surrounding reality, said the words. The theory is good, of course, but wealth doesn't hurt anyone, said the father. So it's not denied by anyone. I just want to say dad, as a lawyer and as Sam, I'm going to be a lot more valuable than becoming middle-income rich. There are dudes out there who are making one billion, but nobody really hears them. They don't know how to influence others, to change reality to their liking. And there's me, who may have $100 in my pocket, but knows how to reach one million people. If you judge by money, when I have $100, I will be able to influence 10 million people. That's why I'm not in a rush for financial results, Sam said. That's it, that's enough. My mom's already calling for dinner, and I have a headache, said Dad, and interrupted Sam at the most interesting place. About the novelty of finally coming to study Sam. Why did you skip classes so many days in a row? Asked the class teacher. When Sam decided to go to school and show himself for once in the last two weeks. I had an honorable reason. And have you lost weight well during this time here is holding you a bouquet. It's not worthy of you, of course. But for now, it's all I can afford, said Sam. Oh, really? Said the teacher. But she accepted the flowers. Now, children, open your notebooks and write the theme of today's lesson. Man and nature. Who can say how man and nature are connected? The teacher asked. Later, when all the students had dispersed, Sam raised his hand. Sam, do you have any thoughts on this subject? She asked. Man. Nature forces a large subject to subject matrix between them. That means that each subject in that matrix has its own interests, and those interests are honored by evolutionary and social convention. If they are violated, we observe a disruption in the matrix. In other words, natural disasters and human tragedies. Tell me please, what should man do to correct the current failures of the matrix? Asked Sam, you're good. You get five for your answer and we will discuss the questions. Later the teacher replied, not wanting to get into Sam's answers. Meanwhile, Sam took the teacher's attention away from himself and spent the rest of the lesson whispering with his new friends. After hearing the latest news from them, he promised everyone that a new carefree life would soon come. On Sam's initiative, Aunt Alice, I tell you so much about my father, but never showed him to you, said Sam at their next meeting. So you said he'll be back from his trip soon. We'll see him then. If he wants to, Alice said. Would you marry him? Sam asked. And Elise laughed. Why do you always have adult questions in your head? Getting married is not like going out for bread. You have to get to know a person better, talk to them for a while, look at them in different circumstances. And only then, if both of them have the same goals for life, you can talk about marriage, Alice said. And it's complicated in your women's heads. You had better heed my advice. There is a very simple way to check a man. If suddenly someone speaks ill of him, you don't want to believe it. Even if he says he's bad, you want to say he's good. If a man like that comes along, you can take him. It's the same with a man. If someone tells him that you are not good, and he will not believe it, then you can be with him for life, said Sam. Wow, that's interesting. How do you know these things? 
asked Alice with interest. It's my personal experience. The other day I was sitting in my office waiting for you, the cleaning lady was cleaning your office. And when she saw the candy wrappers on the floor, she called you a bad word. I couldn't stand it, went up to her and said that your actually very nice wrapper fell on the floor just by accident. If it had been me, I'd have thought you weren't. And I just thought that even if a man is not a race, he can be asked not to do it. That's it, said Sam. God, you're such a smart ass. I can't imagine what it's like to live with you. You could be followed around with a camera and record everything. Or do I have to follow you around with pen and paper like the ancient thinkers? It'll be a compendium of little Sam's wisdom, said Alice and stroked his head. If you're so interested, I can come live with you, said Sam. Alice laughed again. I would be very happy, and your parents won't report me to the police for kidnapping. She asked, there's a more complicated way, but it's reliable. I'll go to the police and declare that under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, I can use juvenile justice. I'll be taken to an orphanage and then declare that you are and apply for adoption with all the red tape. I'll be 18 by then, but I don't think I'd go for that. It's immoral. And a person has to keep a moral framework every day, Sam said. Alice laughed continuously. And the good thing is to ask your parents for a couple of days, no way. If you want, I'll go with you and say I'll take you on a field trip, Alice suggested. Well, since it's such an interesting offer, maybe I'll start by trying to work it out myself. When are we going? Asked Sam businesslike. This weekend we can go, said Alice. It's a deal. And then I'll stay with you tonight. Aren't you afraid to sleep with strange men? Asked Sam. And Alice laughed again. Frank, hello. You have a call from the police. Is Sam your son? They asked Sam's dad on the phone. Yes. What happened? He was scared. You need to bring your son to the station to testify. Details are on the spot. Waiting for you, said the policeman. Sam was just packing her backpack for a trip with Alice. A frightened mother burst into his room. Sam, what have you done? Is that where they call you to the police station? Asked the mother. Dad, calm your wife down, please. And remind her that her son is a licensed attorney, not some lazy teenager. If he's called to the police station, that means he'll be deciding someone's fate. Said Sam. Did you turn the school principal into the police? Asked the mother again. The investigation will determine that. Is the principal, the head teacher, or the parents to blame? I did the main thing. All the mess I saw in the school leaked to social networks, created a resonance. Apparently, the competent authorities reacted. So we avoided a lot of trouble in the future. Mom's not staying late. Dad, are you ready to come with me? Or are you finally going to let me go alone? Sam asked. I'll go with you. Just tell me the truth. You didn't do anything wrong back there. You're a lawyer yourself. I hope you realize that such antics as then, in your first childhood, will bring us a lot of problems. Father begged. Oh, that's it. You grown-ups are no good. I'll go myself. Stay at home, pray to God, and shiver further. And your son went to do justice, said Sam and headed for the exit. The parents followed him. There were many parents at the police station. As soon as they saw Sam, they pounced on his parents with accusations. What is your son doing? He slanders everyone. The little shameful bastards. We should expel him from the school altogether. Where did he come from? Aren't you ashamed to raise such a schemer? They shouted. One of the policemen took Sam into his office and he came out after a couple of hours. In that time, Sam's parents had a little more gray hair on their heads, and the angry parents were also dispersed to different offices. But I had done my job. Let's go home, Sam said. What was that all about? Why all the fuss? asked the mother. I met all the boys in my class the first day I came to this school. A few of them stood out. They were Stas, Yura, and Dinama. I talked to them and concluded that they were psychologically depressed. I followed them after class. And what do you think? They went straight for the garages on the next block. High school kids were waiting for them, extorting money from them. I secretly videotaped the whole thing. After the incident, I approached the boys and asked if they wanted me to help them. They tearfully asked me not to tell anyone about it, as the extortionists threatened them and managed to intimidate them. 
Then I started making inquiries about the extortionists. One of them turned out to be the son of the head teacher, the other of the educational director, the third was the son of some local official. That's when I realized that I couldn't deal with them alone. When I collected all the evidence, I leaked the video on social media, even sent it to the minister of security. That was in the morning. They responded immediately. Well done to the parents of the hooligans, and they themselves received a serious warning. And those boys will now be under the scrutiny of their teachers. Justice has been served, Sam said. But how will you study there now? The principal and the vice principal won't let you stay there any longer. They will press you, said the mother. Well, then we'll have to go to the police offices one more time. There's a penalty for that too. Anyway, enough with the gloomy thoughts. Let's go to a pizza place. I haven't had pizza in a long time, said Sam. He and his father struck hands, while his mother kept reciting a prayer. That's how they sat down at the table. I should have made Suryoga some chicken broth today and that we have lately had a neighbor full of another neighbor. When Sam went out into the yard to chase crows and climb trees. Hello, he said hello to the woman. Stopped in front of her for a few moments and walked on. Hello boy, who are you? I haven't seen you here before? Asked Nicol. I'm Sam's son. My name is Sam. I recently moved in, said Sam and walked on. Where'd you come from? I don't remember them having such a small son. The neighbor asked, I'm just a bastard child. I recently won the right to live with my family in court. And now I've moved in with them by court order. Said the woman was dumbfounded by the answer. Sam noticed and laughed. I'm kidding. I just if possible I should try to be closer to the neighbors to communicate sometimes. If anything, drop in on us. Sam said and walked away. Nickel walked on. Sam turned around and saw a thin woman barely carrying two bags in her hands. Can I help you? Asked Sam. You're too young, you can't handle it, replied the neighbor. But I'll help anyway, Sam said and looked around. His gaze fell on a young guy who was hanging around his car. Hey bro, there's a woman carrying heavy bags, and I'm too small to help her carry them. Maybe you will, and I'll get even with you somehow, Sam said. Hearing the boy's business-like tone, the boy smiled, silently walked over to Nicole, and carried both bags on or followed him. That's it, thank you. Thank goodness I live on the first floor, she said. When they reached their destination, the guy turned around and walked away. Nicole, and not in a hurry, opened the door with her key, and was immediately surprised to see an empty couch in the living room, where her husband usually lies on and looks at the door waiting for his wife three weeks since he had suffered a minor injury at work and was now on sick leave. Nickel carried the bags into the kitchen. The first thing she did was pull out a whole chicken and set the broth to simmer. Then she decided to look for her husband around the apartment. He was not in the kitchen, in the hall on the balcony, where he occasionally looked in. And when she came to the bedroom door, he was stunned by the nasal sounds of feminine moans. Before she opened the door, Nicole took a seat on the couch in the living room, her whole life flashed before her eyes. She and her husband had started everything from scratch. Then the children came along and they had to raise them together, then plow through two three jobs together to give them a good education. And now the children have finished their institutes, found their places in life, and the parents are left alone. Recently, their daughter called them and promised that on the 30th anniversary of the marriage of her parents, she and her husband are preparing a surprise. And the grandson then issued that for the surprise, they are waiting for a trip to some romantic islands. Nicole then thanked fate and looked fondly at her husband, lying with a cast on his leg. Her husband Robert, who had never been used to idleness before, suffered greatly from the fact that now he had to spend his days in front of the television. He was bored staying home alone. Why don't you at least get me a nanny if you don't want to give up at least one job and be home more? He said that the other day. No, I really love my job. Teaching music is my lifelong passion. I can't imagine my life without music and children. If there is a third school that needs a music teacher, I would be willing to work there too, she said then. Now Nickel realized that at that time her husband was not joking. He should have listened. And in general, there is no trust in these men. As soon as they find a reason, so immediately left. 
and sometimes they don't even need a reason. So out of boredom, like her affair? No, that's too cruel. Bringing a strange woman into your own home and having fun with her in broad daylight. It means all their journey together is worthless. It means he's been living with her in a fake life, but his soul is elsewhere all the time. What's more hurtful, unloving or betrayal? But or did it not matter anymore? She took out her cell phone and texted her husband just a few words. I'm filing for divorce. There's no going back. Then she put the phone aside and headed for the exit. As she walked down the stairs, she couldn't hide her emotions. First tears flowed, and all the pain and resentment in her chest turned into bitter sobs. Her gaze immediately fell on a bench near the playground. She went there and sat down on the edge of one bench to cry enough so that no one would hear or see. As soon as she sat down, the silence was broken by a familiar child's voice. Is there something wrong at home? Asked the joking boy who had just introduced himself as the illegitimate son of his parents. Yes, you could say that, she replied. Alcohol is probably like Maria's floor above. Asked Sam. No, my husband hasn't been drinking for a long time. It's something else. You're too old to know. You'll find out when you grow up, said the neighbor. It makes sense. So it's cheating, Sam said. The woman stopped crying. I was surprised again. Sam continued talking men do it for different reasons. Some out of curiosity, some out of boredom, some just for fun. But they all regret it. When the family code comes into play, Sam said. How does it work? Asked the woman. It works in a sobering way. If you want, I'll paint you the prospects of property division in a divorce for adultery, one of the spouses. Then you sit down with your husband in a calm environment and tell him everything, said Sam and began to tell his professional story. When he finished his consultation, the woman took her cell phone out of her pocket and word for word recited what he had said. In short, Robert was facing the poverty of homelessness and old age at a broken trough. Nichols sent the message and with peace of mind, continued chatting with the boy. Until on the corner of her house, she saw her husband sitting in a wheelchair. Wait, what's that supposed to mean? He's outside. Who's in our bedroom then? Asked Nichol and wondered. But it's late, madam, have you already filed for divorce? We've divided your property. He knows everything. Now it's just remarriage, said Sam. But I have a vague suspicion that you've jumped to conclusions. You haven't even seen it with your own eyes. Is he cheating on you? He added, shit. Now at least he didn't have his cell phone on him, Nichols said and headed toward her husband. Robert, how did you get here? She asked, approaching him from behind. Oh, hello, darling. I thought you were coming from the other side. I was waiting for you. Why were you at the grocery store so late again today? Looking for the best chicken and the best meat? I told you not to spoil me like that. I'm better now. I'll be back at work next week, Robert said. No, you tell me, how did you end up on the street? Who pulled you out and where's your cell phone? Nickel asked. I think I left my phone in the apartment. A friend of mine helped me out. It was his day off today, and he and his friend Olsia decided to visit me. They asked me what I wanted. So I honestly said that I would like to get some fresh air. They took me out, and they're sitting at home waiting for you. I turned on the TV for them. Robert answered. Nicole knelt down in front of her husband and hugged him. Are they in the bedroom? She asked. Well, yes, they must have had a few drinks. Let them rest. I authorized it myself, Robert said. Sam winked at the neighbor and went on his way. Mom, tell dad not to call every hour. I'm an adult, after all. I have a personal life, among other things. Bye-bye, see you tomorrow, said Sam and hung up. Where is he anyway? Where is he going to spend the night? Asked excitedly Frank. He said at the girls, said the mother in a whisper. What girl? Laughed the father. You're laughing, but he's been having a pen pal affair with some Alice. From what I understand, she's crazy about him. So there you go. Your son was impossible to ask for any bride in his adult life. And when he became a child, he was a catcher, said the mother. Meanwhile, Sam was the happiest man going on a day trip with Alice. Do you really not have a boyfriend? Or do you just don't want to upset me by talking about him? He asked on the way out.
to be honest, he's gone. After I saw you, after I listened to your childishly smart advice, I realized I was just fooling myself. Looking at your directness, I realized how important it is to be honest with others and with yourself. So I put an end to a failed relationship, I told Alice. You did the right thing, said Sam and patted her on the shoulder. And my dad would never cheat on you, he added, looking out the window. By the way, when is he coming at last? You've told me so much about him, I can't wait to see him, Alice said. He's very sensitive, and he's coming after a momentous occasion. Of course, you could influence this event, but I don't know. We'll see about that. It's a sensitive issue, Sam said. Show me his picture, asked Alice suddenly, but finally. Because I thought you'd never ask for it. Look how he is, said Sam and showed his picture from his former life. He's cute. I feel like I've seen him before, said Alice. No wonder. He told me that he was purposefully dreaming about you at night, so that fate would unite your life paths. You've seen him in your dreams. He's your dream. That's how you know him, said Sam, and they laughed. Would you want a son like that? I asked Sam later. But I think no one could refuse a son like you. What are your plans? Do you want to leave your parents and become my son? Alice asked. No, you could really have a son like me. If you and my father work out, you just please be honest with him, said Sam. But either way, you and I will remain friends, said Alice. Not that it'll last. Oh, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about something more interesting. Women or men? I love gossip, Sam said and sat down. Come closer. Throughout the journey Sam entertained Alice with his witty phrases. As always, he had the goal of making Alice fall in love with the image of an adult Sam, who could come back if she loved him. After the tour, Alice was going to walk her little friend home, and we had a different arrangement. You promised I'd stay the night at your place. Was it for nothing? Did I make a deal with my parents? I remembered Sam. Oh, okay, just for one night. I've never been around little kids after all. I'm just worried, said Alice. Alice had noticed since the morning that her little friend was always looking away, looking nervously at his phone. He answers someone briefly and drops someone else's calls. In short, he can't tear himself away from his phone. One of these conversations took place with Andrew. Sam, hey kid. So when can we expect your dad? I already told Vanessa. She's getting ready to be assigned to another company. And we're expecting your dad instead. What kind of irresponsible attitude is that? How can a businessman be so careless? He was indignant. Andrew, everything is almost solved. How about appointing me in his place for now? I can handle his duties. That I promise you, Sam told him. No, don't make me laugh. You better tell your daddy I'm willing to wait another week for him. If he shows up, let him take over. And if not, then let him go on with his dark deeds. That's what he said. And then Paul called several times. He was already in the city and hurried to meet his old friend. At the same time, they were going to discuss the details of their business together. But even then, they had to work around it. Kid, I don't recognize my friend. How come he gave his cell phone to someone and then disappeared? It's all very strange, he said into the phone. If you're his real friend, you should understand and believe him. He's got one last task left. As soon as he does it, he'll show up right away. You please, show some more patience and wait for him. I convinced Sam. Who are you to him? A nephew, I guess? Asked Paul. No, I'm his son. He just didn't tell anyone. I made sure everyone knew. But he and I have been in close contact all this time, and I know everything he does. Said Sam. What a surprise. So many years of being friends with a man and not even a hint of a baby. Baby. I'd love to get to know you too. But you better hurry up, cause the big people have their hopes up. It's no good keeping them waiting, Paul said goodbye. Yeah, sending my father in his place won't work this time. Better to seek rescue from Alice, Sam concluded. And with renewed vigor he began to conquer her. Now the lady must rest, and the gentleman will take care of the surprise. What would you like for dinner? Asked Sam, when they finally reached Alice's apartment. Can't we just order a cooked meal and watch cartoons? Suggested Alice. And when you have a husband will you also offer to order cooked food and watch soccer with him? 
asked Sam. Alice laughed again until her stomach cramped. Sam, for all the time I've known you, you have asked me so many questions about my non-existent husband and about my relationship with him that I even feel married and with a child like you. How do you manage it all? She asked. I just really see you as a good wife and mother. And do you mind? He asked. To be honest, I'd like that too. But I'm trying not to be starry-eyed. You have to be realistic. There is no such person who just one in one guesses your wishes and all the time on the same wavelength with you. Adults are more complicated. They can change their minds at any time. And the worst part is not telling you about it, Alice said sadly. My dad's not like that. He's in over his head, said Sam. Everyone thinks so. Why do you live? By everyone's standards, you're centered on yourself, because I've noticed. Do you want to fit in with the general rules? Like, do you want pure love? But I've been trying to prove to you all this time that if a person is interesting to you, and you do him, it's easy to grow and nurture love on such soil. And you adults do the opposite. First, you cultivate love in your head. And then with closed eyes you look for points of contact in a person. And maybe he wasn't there in the first place. Finding the real truth. Disappointing. Said Sam. What are you getting at? I sometimes lose the thread of the conversation. My point is that you have a better chance of building a strong relationship with my dad because I'm already building an image of him in your head. You already have an idea of him, and you'll notice that I'm not hiding the fact that he has his faults. For example, he likes to have fun like me in a childish way because it helps him regain his energy. And so when you see him, try to trust and love him. He will love you for sure. You will be happy forever. Then, if you want, you can have a son like me. If you want, you can have two or three or four, all of them like me. That's great, said Sam and winked with one eye. Listen, you talk so much about your dad. I can't wait to see him. How about we call him on the video now and talk to him? Alice suggested. Sam got excited. It seemed his goal was close at hand. He crossed his fingers behind his back and prayed to God. There is an easier way. He can appear before you tonight or tomorrow morning. Only for that you have to do something, said Sam. What? asked Alice. Well, kiss me, for example. Alice laughed again. You leftist. Strangers don't kiss strangers. It's just unethical. But that doesn't mean I'm mean to you. It's just that boundaries and distance is good for everyone. Alice said as she made up the bed in the living room. She then tucked her little friend in, put her teddy bear next to him, and retired to her room. Alice got up early in the morning to take the stranger's child to his house on time. She went into the kitchen to make herself some coffee, but when she saw the picture, she almost fainted. Sam was lying face down on the floor. He had a small paper in his hand. Alice ran to him, turned him over on his back and started shaking him. But there was no reaction. She took the paper and once again was shocked by the writing. I have no reason to live in a world of such sentiments of adults. She wrapped her arms around his head and started crying. I'm sorry, baby, how could you do this? Why did I have to suffer such grief? What will I tell your parents? I'm sorry if I hurt you in any way. Just open your eyes. You have to live. You're gonna be fine, Sam. Open your eyes. God, what have you done? Fussing. She's wiping the tears from her face. A few minutes later, the ambulance she managed to call arrived. The doctor examined the boy and was surprised. All his vitals were normal. Maybe it's just a person sleeping so soundly. But just in case, we are taking him to the ward, he said. The other took Sam in an armful and put him on a stretcher. Alice went out after them. And lastly decided to address her friend once more. She walked over to the supposedly unconscious Sam and placed her cheek against his cheek. His cheeks felt warm. Then she gently kissed his forehead and whispered in his ear, I will be by your side no matter what happens. You'll come to your senses very soon and you won't do anything stupid again. Guys, let's go to the clinic, the doctor said. And you lady, if you want, you can follow us, he added. Wait, I'll stay. There was a voice from the ambulance cab. Someone knocked from inside. It was Sam. Thank you all for your attention, but I'm better now. I have to run an errand, he said. Nimbly jumped off the stretcher and ran away. Well, there you go, lady. 
you shouldn't have bothered us for nothing. The kid decided to play a trick on you because he's just a kid. The fine for a false call will have to be paid by you, the doctor said, turning to Alice. Paul, how long can we wait for you? You've been in my city for a week and you still haven't met me. Come on, come out to your friend, he is waiting for you under the window," said Sam on the phone. Paul came out a couple minutes later, they hugged and greeted each other. What are you doing out on the street like that? Let's go home and we have a lot to talk about," said Paul. Listen where the hell have you been? But that boy who was carrying your phone is a smart one. He was doing a great job as your assistant. He was even willing to take over for you. Who introduced him to me? Paul asked. First things first. Yes, I will as soon as he is born, said Sam and smiled enigmatically. So here's the conversation. We're all set. Opening in a couple weeks while the office is getting ready, final touches are coming. You and I will go there now and meet Mark tonight. He'll sign the order appointing you. That's the end of the story. By the way, what about personal? We have a traditional approach to our image. You should think about getting married. It'll give you credibility in Mark's eyes. Anyway, it's time you and I made up our minds, Paul said. I'm ready to get married. I just have to ask a young lady to marry me. Or maybe wait until she offers it to me. Sam said thoughtfully. The meeting with Mark. That evening. Sam had really impressed him. The arrangements had been made. All that remained now was to get down to business. When Sam was finally on his way to his apartment with peace of mind, the bell rang. Sam, where are you going? Are they asking you at school? Can they expel you if you don't show up? A month of truancy. That's no joke. Stop what you're doing and get to school," said Frank. Dad, tell them that your son has decided to skip school and go straight into a career and the family doesn't need to pretend anymore," said Sam. It happened. Congratulations. Who's the sorceress? Frank asked, when he realized his son was an adult again, about the rest. Then dad to mom and say hi and wait for news from me. All by, he said lastly and started dialing another phone number. Sam, you're elusive. Where the hell have you been? Maybe the kid will go to lead instead of you. And you are going to hide. Andrew replied threateningly. Vanessa's place has been vacant for a week now. She's moving to another company. When are you ready to start? He asked. Andrew, thank you very much for your trust in my person but I decided to go elsewhere," said Sam. But I'm very grateful. And to Vanessa for mentoring me too. We're not saying goodbye. I'll always be in touch. And expect a wedding invitation from me soon," said Sam. Oh, there it is. Well, if this is the way it's going to turn out, it's all for the best," said the former boss. Sam went to his apartment, put it in perfect order and enjoyed his life. How good it is when you don't have to make up anything. Tell everyone everything as it is. And yes, my adult life wasn't so bad, he wrote in his journal a couple minutes before there was a knock on the door. He went to open the door, and there was a girl standing there who looked painfully familiar. Hello, you must be Sam's dad. I'm his girlfriend. He was just a little sick this morning, and I've been worried about him all day. I wanted to visit him. So I baked his favorite pie, the girl said shyly. Well, hello, Alice. Come in. Is your friend waiting for you?" said Sam and smiled. Alice was nervous and fussed the same daddy Sam. Really turned out to be so gallant, courteous and interesting, as that little boy described. To keep the conversation going, Sam had to tell the whole story. Alice laughed, she was indignant, she was surprised, but in the end she was convinced that it was a wonderful story. I was really from beginning to end, so there was no such boy but I grew attached to him. He convinced me that my son would be just like him. And I believed in that reality, I told Alice sadly. He was telling the truth. Such a Sam can indeed appear, but he can only appear with you and me. I would like that very much. Are you ready to go with me in life, to raise our children and admire them? Asked Sam, kneeling down. I'm looking forward to it, replied Alice. A few days later, all the people close to Sam finally waited for news from him. Each of them received an invitation to the wedding, and the young barely had time to prepare for the event. On the one hand, the opening of a new company where Sam is the head. On the other hand, a gathering of loved ones, pleasant troubles, 
But in moments of fatigue, the bride and groom remembered their goal about little Slavic, and all the fatigue vanished at once.